Good morning, everyone. Our group was tasked with an assignment to create a resource guide in the digital digitization and digitalization of trade. We are honored and excited to share our findings with you all today. We also want to share a special thank you to our amazing project sponsor, Brian Gordon, as well as our supportive and patient <laughs> project mentor, Maloon Bozies. We also want to take this time to acknowledge the efforts of our team members who are not able to join us in Orlando today, Antonio, Giovanni, and Kubra. Let's get started. So we're gonna do our absolute best to combine the last three months of work into our presentation for you this morning, first emphasizing the benefits of digitalization in trade, which we'll definitely want once we then move into the current reality and challenges that are being faced by legal and also our stakeholders. We'll then focus on our existing technology that's available to us to help us move on with our trade digitalization solution. Finally, we'll wrap it up with our short, medium, and long-term recommendations. Now, to start us off, we can, we can ponder on the slide for a second, but I want to level set on digitization versus digitalization. So while digitization focuses on the recording and converting of data, digitalization actually is the development of processes and the changing of workflows that improve our manual systems. So now we can move on to the benefits. And I must admit that uh, when we are thinking about the benefits, our group is guilty of thinking of only from a banker's perspective. But we now know that we are not the only stakeholders involved. We've got the shipping and logistics providers, we've got the fintech providers, and of course we've got the importers and exporters. And that's when we realized that throughout this project, we actually wanted to take a special focus on the importers and exporters as the potential end user of this digitalized trade solution. It is vital to have their willingness and wanting adoption of this solution in order to, for it to be successful. And with that, I'll turn it over to Bridget to discuss legal. Thank you, Angel, and good morning, everyone. Aside from the tech challenges mentioned thus far, the lack of legislation across various jurisdictions on electronic trade documents is the major blocking point. Among the efforts for compliant legislation is the model law on electronic transferable records. Now, we don't have enough time, unfortunately, to go into the depths of what this framework is known as M leader. However, I do want to point out some of the main concepts. The definition of electronic transferable records be coupled with trade documents, the requirement of control, and the standardization of reliability. Now, this sounds like we have a good foundation, right? And yet only nine jurisdictions, and I repeat, only nine jurisdictions, have adopted M-Leader. Other countries have started, but they have no date set. One story that we hope will usher others is the United Kingdom. They were able to modernize a law that was established in 1882 into the Electronic Trade Documents Act. This act is flexible where only one place has to be digitized enabled. As a result, the ICC has projected Euro 25 billion growth in 2024. This is where our recommendation comes in. In 2021, this topic was already discussed whereby our peers stated that BAFT, along with other industry associations like the ICC and ITFA, could advance that discussion. And similar to our peers before, we're also asking for a call to action, and that could be changed to should. So let's take a step back. If we think about paper money and how it was transformed into digitized and credit payments like Apple Pay, Google Pay, why can't we apply that for trade? Why is it that we are faced with a plethora of questions? Granted that legislation and regulation have to be consistent. That's imperative. This is why we are asking policymakers at a global and local level to make these things nimble to allow for the legalization of digitization in trade. And with that, I will pass it on to my teammate, Chris, who will dive in into our survey. Thank you, Bridget. So we conducted a survey and received feedback from 80 industry professionals, many of which are in the room with us today. And actually, thank you for that, because this let us get a lot of valuable insight on the current, on the current uh, the state of the industry, the challenges, and the opportunities of trade digitalization. So we already touched on the legal barrier. And we don't have 20 minutes, won't be enough to go over all the other things we saw from the survey, but it's well documented in our resource guide. So legal barriers aside, we realized that the main focus of today would be the major hurdles. 
So the first, with 31% of uh, respondents, was cost. So we understand that, especially in this current environment, this is a very important KPI. But the way we see it, if we don't invest today, in five, 10, or 15 years, you're going to be listening to other future leaders talking about <laughs> the potential benefits of applying to the digitalization globally. Second was ubiquitous solutions. And this is where we also tried to, to help the readers. We provided a comprehensive list of providers that address specific challenges some stakeholders might face today. Third, which we understand completely, was maybe a matter of trust, where the, some people raise the concerns around compliance, data breaches, and, uh, and laws. And we fully understand that, but we believe that through rich, faster, and more transparent data with the right tools, this can only lead to a safer trade environment. So maybe it's just a matter of education. One in five of the respondents mentioned that they have little to no information on the benefits of trade digitalization. So where do we start? Every one of the respondents agreed that we are dissatisfied with the current process. So we agree that we need to start, and we need to start somewhere. You highlighted that the ideal starting point would be letters of credits. So we have Daniel who can actually tell us some more about that. Thank you, Chris. So if we look at the entire trade ecosystem, there's a lot going on, right? There's a lot of information lines that are being passed, and there's a lot of information that's going across. But the important thing to consider is the importer and the exporter, as Angel noted. So why these are the most important members of the trade transaction is because they're the ones actually obtaining value from the transaction. So if we take the actual scenario of an importer out of New Jersey importing coffee from a fine distributor out of the Middle East, we take that scenario, the importer reaches out to their bank, that bank has to reach out to the receiving bank, pass some information across, pass some paper across, they need that from a legal perspective, and then they reach out to the logistics provider, have to pass the information across on that side, you can start to see where it goes, right? So there's a, there's a lot of challenges with that, and we do have obligations, but as we say, we need to open that up from a legal perspective. So if we go to the next slide, we see from an ideal state, we connect the entire ecosystem, right? So in this state here, we're essentially saying, sourcing our FinTech providers, we are now taking all of the organizations that are involved and removing the disconnect. What we see with our organizations are essentially digital islands that we've established, where we're all developing at different rates. But we do have the technology in place, and Anjana is gonna be speaking on that, but the actual technology is there for us to be connecting, right? And keeping in line with the whole BATH theme is how do we build those bridges? How do we build the bridges to connect our foundations and how do we connect them through our technology so that we can drive value to our underlying clients? So I'll pass things over to Anjana to speak on technologies. Thank you, Daniel. Good morning, everyone. In contemporary times, combining fancy tech with new ideas has opened big opportunities. Let's explore how leveraging cool tech and teamwork can help digital trade more secure, safer, and user-friendly for all. At the heart of this transformation lies three key pillars, the Power Trio, APIs, DLT, and AI. These elements serve as the bridge connecting stakeholders ensuring transaction security, and enabling automation for enhanced efficiency. Unlock effectiveness in trade with innovative solutions like OCR for seamless digitization, digital signatures for authentication, and smart contracts for automated transparent agreements. Moving on to the next slide. We are witnessing a wave of transformative solutions in digitalization, reshaping the global business landscape. In our resource guide, we have categorized these cutting edge solutions into five main areas. Multi-banking front-end solutions, document exchange platforms, AI-powered document checking solutions, smart contracts, digital signatures. These solutions are engineered to enhance efficiency, ensure security, automate processes, 
ensures seamless transaction while safeguarding the authenticity and integrity of documents. Additionally, we have curated a list of service providers for each category, offering reliable references to explore further. To the next slide. Most of you are likely familiar with this image. This captures the diverse businesses fueling our ecosystem, from industry giants to innovative startups, driving trade finances, digital evolution. Beyond a mere collection of companies, the trade tech ecosystem thrives on collaboration, innovation, and a shared vision for digital trade finances future. Now, on to the main point. Embracing these technologies and solutions isn't optional. It is imperative to stay competitive. So let's all try to make a secure, efficient, and future-ready digital trade ecosystem together. Thank you so much. Now I would like to invite Chris to take you further. Thank you, Anjana. So the purpose of this resource guide was to supply the readers with a roadmap to achieving trade digitalization across all geographies. So we understand and we highlighted the challenges that we face in achieving this today. And we set out some short, medium, and longer term milestones that can help guide us. So on the short term, we're looking at two things mainly. First is the standardizations of agreements and legal frameworks. So for example, we have the MLETR today. But it's of little use when the application can vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. We can barely agree on anyway how to name the abbreviation, if it's MLETR or MLETR. So, and this is where we look to the policy makers today to align and agree on the applications of such laws as we lay the foundations to move forward. Second, and beyond the documentary aspect, we look, at, we look to the other enablers in the value chain, such as SWIFT, banks, and the fintechs, to collaborate on data standardization, leading us to the medium term. And this is where we focus on the end-to-end -end connectivity across the value chain. It's only through cooperation that true value will be created through the legal and rich exchange of data. And this is where we touch on the interoperability. Having access to that ne network will provide various stakeholders different opportunities, not to mention the valuable insight throughout the logistical journey of the goods. On the longer term, this is where we start seeing the network, network effect and the benefits of true adoption of, tra of trade digitalization. This is where we see the reduction and removal of a lot of constraints some stakeholders face today with regards to resources, size, geography, and access to financing. On our final slide, you'll see that this is kind of what we saw based on our interviews and research, where everyone's just trying to point at each other saying they need to do this and they need to do that. We saw there's a lot of effort being <laughs> undertaken by different stakeholders in a very siloed way. And if anyone knows the movie you might be referring to here, you would know that it's only through cooperation and collaboration that we can move forward. Thank you for listening to us. And with that, we're happy to take any questions. So I will kick it off with, I think maybe in order, in your research, what are importers and exporters targeting? Angel, would you like to answer that? Yeah, I can take that, Bridget. So if I'm thinking in the mind of an importer and exporter, I'm an exporter, what am I concerned about? Getting paid, getting paid on time, control of my title documents. If I'm an importer, I'm concerned about getting my goods in a timely fashion, the quality of those goods. So where do they turn? letters of credit to mitigate those risks. However, when you use a letter of credit, it then comes with those challenges that we were you know, speaking to in the beginning. Um, not being familiar with the proper structuring letters of credit that lead to discrepancies, documentation loss, cost, all of these things we are looking to target with our potential trade digitalization solution that shows, for example, visibility end to end for our importers and exporters and all of the stakeholders involved. Um, I will take probably a combination of like the next two questions because they're sort of linked where I see one says custom agents live and maybe love to stamp things. It is how they control, not to say, and I apologize, I'm a little bit blind, they're told things, 
how they will accept a digital world without paper, or how do you think they shift their personal influence to a new di digital trade? And I'll couple that with the question, do you see industry associations acting or contributing enough to make trade more digital? So the reason that I couple these questions is because in our research and where we're pointing out that BAFT, along with the other industry associations, need to act, we also saw um, leadership from BIMCO. We saw leadership from Fit Alliance, where they were partnering with um, e-bill, um, electronic bills of lading, and they created an interoperable platform where actually they combined multiple platforms and they've worked with two institutions, with Deutsche Bank and BNY Mellon. And so we see a lot of them creating these solutions and you know, going along with what Daniel said on digital islands. The solutions and everybody's creativity is great, but what we want to encourage is more of that collaboration because essentially if everybody has their own solution, then the importers and exporters will be faced with, who do I go with? What will I do next? So we have these actors that are already taking shape and that they're creating these solutions, which goes into the first question about um, if they you know, live and love to stamp. <laughs> well, in the pandemic, a lot of the ships, a lot of the aircraft, they were, they were at a halt. They, they couldn't do anything because of the paper tracking. And that's where I made my point earlier that if we're using Google Pay and we're using digital payments, Venmo, PayPal, all of that, well, you do need some sort of tra trackable record, and that's where the M leader comes in. And I think it's really more of having an openness to adopt that, because if you have those ships that are not moving anywhere because you have that paper document that you haven't received, you're losing money, and that's a big cost. And it trickles down all the way from beginning to end. And we're in the business of making money, so you know that to me is already a motivator enough where that will influence them to be adopting digitization. And then I will move it on to another question. Um, who do you think needs slash must act first in the ecosystem? <laughs> Daniel, Chris? Yeah, so I think first off, definitely from a legal perspective, we need to be attacking that piece first. But I think it kind of goes hand in hand on how, how do we connect everyone, right? Because the challenge is with the smaller enterprises that are involved. I think with our source technologies that we were talking about, we can now basically bring that across the board. Things have become a lot cheaper. Of course, resourcing is always a major concern, but I think in our current state, we can be sourcing technologies that are, that are cheaper, like APIs and things like that, where we can create visibility across the board. So I think in many ways, we don't wanna boil the ocean, but in many ways we can't, right? Because the information is there. All of these companies that we are looking at, they're already digital. So in many ways, it's just that connection point, right? So in, as Anjana was mentioning, there, there are some amazing technologies that are out there that essentially we can even be supporting the smaller enterprises and connecting them. So I think really on that side, it, there are many ways that we can be doing it and connecting us. I think to add to that, maybe because I covered the legal part, I would say that it needs to start on the legal framework. And then from the legal framework, it goes down into governments, into regulations, down into banks, and then even into the smaller regional banks. Because if we also look at our banking system, we know that the big banks are always going to move forward and propel um, change, but at the end of the day, it also goes down to you know, your local banks, the ones that you see, your retail banks. And so I think in that sense, if we don't see that motivation or that change being applied to the legal frameworks, it's really not going to move the needle. Otherwise, everyone's gonna have, again, their own different variety of their interpretation. And that's, I think, really at the crux, at least in the beginning of this change, is to start legislation for digitization and trade. I think maybe I can adjust the percentage of the community considered time slash resources as a challenge. I think that would fall under the same bucket as the cost, uh, with about 30% of the respondents. But I do believe that it's a matter of priority at the end of the day. But unless there's some pressure on doing this, that it will remain not a priority and no one will act. I think our main message for you to take away is to collaborate. I think we're all here to, yes, do business and compete with one another, but we've, taught, we've seen the benefit of Swift, we've seen the benefit of other products, and once we're aligned, I think we can carry our own business and continue competing with each other, but it's important that we do collaborate on this topic. With that, I hope that you do come up to us, read our paper, um, ask away, and thank you all for your time and attention.